posture, the words that come off our lips, the feeling from our spirit, Lord, that we thank you, Lord, that we trust you, Lord, that no matter what the world throws at us, the world's going to throw stuff at us left and right, left and right, left and right, but you've already paid the price. You've already given everything. You've already made the way. And God, may that just resonate throughout this church, throughout this world who calls on your name. Lord, I pray you speak to us today. Lord, I pray that today uh, I'm nothing more than your microphone, that I'm your vessel. Lord, take any thoughts, words, or actions out. This is your message. Lord, speak to us today. Lord, guide us today. Lord, strengthen us today. Lord, we want to hear from you. What a friend you have been. You are so good to us. So, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we love you. And it's in your precious name we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen. Well, good morning, One Step Church. Is everybody warming up a little bit? You can tell it's cold in here when during some of the worship songs I'm clapping my hands and it hurts. It's like, it's like ice hitting each other. But, you know, you take what you can get. That's why we have blankets, right? I like that. So, good morning. Welcome to everybody. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad you could join us. We'd love to have you join us in person. If you're in the Miami area, if we haven't met before, I'm Pastor Rich. I have the incredible pleasure and privilege of co-pastoring this church with my wife, Pastor Yoli, and uh, this amazing crew here at One Step Church. So, if you're around, come check us out. If not, thanks for being there. And if my family's watching, morning, guys. Hopefully, Mom's watching. Morning, Mom. Hope you're doing good today. Ready to jump into a message. Uh, well, first off, I want to say thank you to the whole team. Uh, I've actually had, uh, from preaching duties, I've had the past two weeks off. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Yoli brought a great word as we finished up the forgiveness series. She talked about Joseph and the brothers and the restoration that came out of that forgiveness relationship. And then Manny brought an amazing word last week, which uh, I'm so thankful for. And he talked about the forgiveness of Jesus. And it just impacts our life in every single way. So I, I was pleasure, it was such a pleasure to be able to take last weekend off and, and take care of some family stuff. But now I'm back. I miss being up here. I miss being in church. You know, it's unbelievable. Even just one week off of church, it feels like forever. You know, it's like from the sandlot. Forever. It feels like forever. But today we are starting a new series. I, I, can't, I can't believe March is already upon us. It's crazy. We're already in the first week of March. And then when the team, we were looking at the calendar earlier this year, and we planned out the teaching series for the year, and we're like, okay, when's Easter? It's in March. Are you kidding me? It's already January. We got to get on the ball, people. It's, uh, so the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at this series we've called The Path. The Path. Now, what's it inspired by? Well, some of you may have heard uh, over the years, uh, I know especially in the Catholic Church, they have what's called the Stations of the Cross. And, and Becky and the team did an amazing job setting up the nice display over there. And what are the stations of the cross? Well, it is literally the journey detailing the time from Jesus' arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane to him going to the cross in detail, each one of the stops, each one of the places. Well, we, we figured, because we want it to be also, you know, a teaching, preaching, and an opportunity to learn about this, well, we want to call it the path because it's the path we're on. It's the path that everybody in their life has. And we're going to liken it to the path that Jesus took. Now, I like the idea that we can be a little more detailed here. We're going to spend a little time on every single one of these sections, but I don't know if you guys remember. I, I'm, uh, the show was out a few years ago. I, I'm, I don't get a whole lot of time to watch TV. I'll usually watch a, about one season of a show, and then I either lose interest or I got too much going on, I never get back to it. But a few years ago, there's a show that came out called 24, Jack Bauer. It was a great show, a lot of action, a lot of stuff, but it was a new concept in TV series or movies, it was a moment-by-moment -moment play. In other words, one hour of TV time was literally one hour of time in his adventures or in his action and everything going on. And, and it, it creates a different atmosphere. One, you get to know the characters a little bit more. You get to know the situations a little bit more. You get to know the storyline a little bit more. And you get a little more detailed and intense to it. But then you're watching a whole season of their show and you're going, does this guy ever get a break? I mean, seriously. You know, I mean, I get my 24 hours sometimes looks like that, you know, but poor guy can't even, like, go to the bathroom without somebody attacking him, you know. It's, like, crazy. And we look at that, and, we, and I thought, man, that would be a great concept to approach this teaching series. Now, it's not moment by moment, but most people don't realize, especially when you're reading through the chapters in the Gospels about this, we're talking about less than a 24-hour period from the time Jesus is arrested to the time he hangs on the cross. It's less than 24 hours, people, that all this happens 
all this going on where Jesus is led to ultimately die and sacrifice himself for us. So we want to look at that as the path. Well, the first thing I want to look at is the teaching today I've titled, It Started with Betrayal. It Started with Betrayal. The, 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 the path that Jesus took started with betrayal. Well, we're going to break that down in a second. But, but what I want us to understand is every journey in life, every time you're going somewhere, there's a path. There's a beginning and there's a destination. The space in between those two points is the journey itself. That's where we actually experience the stuff. You know, the, the beginning point is significant. The end point is significant. But what happens between A and Z? Well, that's massive. That's what we want to look at throughout this series. And it's like, well, well Rich, I, I get it. You know, this, this path that Jesus was on, this path that he took was amazing. And, and, but he's going to sacrifice himself on the cross. That's, I hope that's not my path, you know. I mean, you know, I, I get a paper cut and I'm ready to pass out. I, I really don't want to go that route. But I, I believe that not only are we going to honor Jesus Christ through this path series and look at each one of the steps that he went through and what it entailed, but I think that it resonates and speaks into our lives. Now, you might say, how? I'm, I, I'm not on any kind of path like that. Well, yeah, we all are. Why do I say that? Well, Jesus Christ is intentional in everything he says. He doesn't say things just for the heck of it. In the Gospels, he also tells us, whoever wants to follow me has to take up their cross and come after me. He does everything with intentionality. He knew where he was going at the end of all this. He knew that he was going to the cross. So think ahead. When he's telling us this in the scriptures, before it actually happens, he knew where he was going. Why did he make that reference? Because we need to understand that the path that he he's on and the path that he went through resonates in every single one of our lives. Because... The day we come into a life with Jesus Christ, the path starts. His was betrayal in the garden. Ours is when we give our life. Where's the end destination? When we stand in front of him one day as our Lord and Savior, you know, Father in heaven. It's the path in between. It's the journey that we take in between there. That's what's significant. That's what's going to impact us. So as we break down each one of these parts of this moment in Jesus' life, this snippet, if you will, out of 33 years on earth, out of three years of active ministry, we're going to focus on a 24-hour period for the next few weeks. And I pray that it speaks to each and every one of us because it's already been speaking to me just in preparing this series. Well, what's the first point I want to look at? The first point I want to look at is time in the garden. Time in the garden. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'll, I'll preface this with maybe I'll, I'll take it more from a, a perspective of my B.C. time, my before Christ time, because we all have a B.C. time. I don't care how righteous we are. We all have a B.C. time. We all love to forget our B.C. times, and I get that. But in my B.C. time especially, if I found out, hey, Rich, you got 24 hours to live. Oh, good Lord, I'm going to make some damage. I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to go out with a bang. Because before I gave my life to Christ, everything to me was what I experienced in life defines the life I lived. Which, after I die, it doesn't really matter. Whether you had millions of dollars or one dollar, when you die, you die. You can't take it with you. Whether you, you amassed tons of fortune, whether you were famous or not, when you die, you die. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, what do you believe? That I experienced all this so that I can die and I can forget it. What a miserable thought process. No. I believe that what we experience is going to impact us in our eternal life. And that's what's amazing. But in my BC time, I probably would have said, oh, we're going for broke. I'm going to empty out my bank account. I'm going to run up on my credit cards. Sorry, kids, I'm going to pass it on to you. I'm going to go out blazing. That's how I'm going to go out if I knew I had 24 hours to live. So what does Jesus do? Did Jesus do the same thing? Did he tell the disciples, hey, guys, dinner was great. We had a great time. Let's hit the tavern. Let's go out and let's have a party. No, no, that's not what Jesus did. It would have made for an interesting story in the Bible, but that's not what he did. What does Jesus do? Jesus goes to a garden with his disciples. He goes to a garden. Why a garden? Well, let's find out. We're going to be doing a lot of reading out of Luke chapter 22, so if you have your Bibles there, while I'm, I'm setting it up, you can go there. If not, we'll have it on the screen. Jesus goes after the Last Supper, after the moment where he finally tells the disciples, he gives the sacrament that we now do today of the body and the blood. And he then says, hey, let's go get away. Let's get away from everybody else. He takes his disciples with him. And even in the garden, he identifies 
Peter, James, and John as separate to have time with him. And he goes to a garden. I mean, I'm sorry. If I have all that in my mind of what's coming, what's going to happen, I'm going to go to a garden. But why? In Luke 22, 39 through 41, it reads, Coming out, he being Jesus, went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, meaning he's done this many times before, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, being the garden, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. Went to the garden, told them to pray so they wouldn't fall into temptation, and then he knelt down and prayed. You know, gardens and, and quiet places carry a massive significance in our life. I, I remember years ago when Yoli was working on uh, one of her degrees that we, we would have annual passes to the old parrot jungle when it used to be in Pinecrest and Pinecrest Gardens. It was beautiful. It was great. Uh, I would try and take the kids out sometimes to give her a little time to either work on stuff or do studies. And we would all go as a family some days. Some days I would just take the kids. Other days I would go by myself. And even after all the parrots left and it was much quieter, I would still go there from time to time, either as family or even by myself. Why? It was quiet. It was away. It was nature. It was a moment for me to process and think, get away from everything, get away from the hecticness, the craziness of everything going on in the world. Well, that's what Jesus was doing here. I'm very big on the fact that we need to not only read the scriptures and say, okay, everything is an instruction. No, sometimes Jesus' examples. Don't just look at the words he says. Look at the life he lived. You see, Jesus didn't have to say, I'm going here to get away. To, I'm sorry, you can, you can pick up on that. He needed time alone. He needed a quiet place. He needed to get away. He wanted to just kind of step out. And, and I can appreciate that because when things are hectic and crazy, Sometimes just going for a nice walk, getting away from everything. Sometimes walking up by the bay and looking out at the ocean and the beautiful creation he has just to get away. Just have a moment to commune with, with the Heavenly Father and find out what he has. Well, what did this garden most likely look like? Well, if, if, if there should be an image there. I, it, it took me a little while to find because even in the background you can see you know, buildings and stuff like that. Nowadays the Garden of Gethsemane still exists. It's in Israel. So the Garden of Gethsemane, Nowadays has benches and statues and everything else. So I was trying to look for a picture that is just straight up trees and the plants that are native to the area or that are around there. This would be somewhat what it would have looked like for Jesus. This is where he decided to spend his last moments before being arrested. Why? Well, because he needed to get away and do what? Pray. Pray. I mean, think about that. Pray. Usually prayer is one of the last things we go to, just being real with everybody. I know we try and get better in our prayer life and be stronger about it, but usually prayer ends up becoming one of the last things, especially when we're stressed out, especially if we know something bad's happening, we're going through something. Oh, God, I don't know what to do in this situation. He's probably sitting there going, did you not read what my son did when he was one of, in one of the worst moments of his life? He stopped and he prayed. Oh, gee, God, I don't know what to do. How do I handle this? Just speak to me, God. Just do what my son did. Stop for a second and pray. Take a moment away. Get away. Get away and pray. Um, we need to have that place. What is your place? What is your place? If you're online, what's your place? Everybody has to have a place they go to. I don't care if it's, well, Rich, I don't have any extra spaces. I know some people that are, are blessed enough to have a true prayer closet, literally a space in their house set up that's only for prayer. I don't have that, Rich. Okay. Go to your car. Lock the door. Lock your kids in their room. I didn't mean that literally. Don't get me in trouble. Anyways, get away. Where do you get away to? Everybody has to have a place to get away. Everybody. If you don't, then find somewhere. It makes all the difference in the world. And once again, we have to practice what we preach because I can say all day long that I need a place to get away, and then I don't do it. And then a few days turns into a few weeks, and before you know it, I haven't had time with God. I haven't had a place to get away and quietly pray to him just like Jesus did. Do we take that time? find that place. I'm not going to define it for you. If you have an extra spare bedroom in your house, okay, then go there. Get away from everything. If it's when everybody's out of the house for a few moments, I, I wouldn't say during traffic time because you really can't concentrate on praying to God. You're too busy trying not to die on the roads out here. But you need to get away and pray. Why? Because it is what Jesus exampled. I figure if Jesus did it, it's pretty important. Why? Well, if Jesus was both man and God at the same time, well, he knows that the end result. You know, the funny thing is, Jesus already knows he won. 
He already knows. Yet he still went through the same experience as a human being, as a man in the flesh. So if Jesus had to do it, why don't we? Why don't we? We're all on the path like I talked about. This is the first step in the path for Jesus Christ. The first step before he was going to face anything was to stop and think. Do we do that? If we do, how often do we do it? And with what intentionality do we do it? it it's been since Old Testament times. Psalm 27, 7 through 9. This is David, the man after God's own heart, singing here in a psalm, in one of his psalms, when he would cry out in anguish and pain. It says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Not when I speak, not when I just talk, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face I will seek, Lord. Now do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. This was David. He was a king. He was a warrior. He amassed all kinds of power and strength and Yet what does he cry for? God, when I seek you, don't hide yourself from me. God, when I seek you, be there for me. Well, Jesus is of the seed of David in the line. So what is he doing when he's in anguish and he's hurting and he's lost in a moment? He goes to God in prayer. That's where he starts his path. Every single day we start a path for that day. So just as Jesus was getting ready to start this 24-hour period, he started with prayer. How do we start our 24-hour period? We start with prayer? I'm going to be straight up with you. I don't start every one of my mornings with prayer. I don't. There's days when that alarm goes off and that snooze button, I'm just slapping that. I'm about to throw my phone against the wall. Pastors aren't supposed to get angry. Oh, sorry, I got emotions. But yet, it makes such a difference when I start my day with prayer. It makes a massive difference. Yet, do I do it every time? No, that's on me. That's not on God. Now, I do want to bring up one little side note. I'll take a little side note here. Uh, especially in the evangelical churches nowadays is, you know, we, we are very big on telling people, you know, that coming into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is a personal relationship. It's not a religion thing. In other words, it's not some rote thing where we have to do certain things to obtain certain salvation levels. It's, it's just, it's a personal relationship. Now, what I will say, though, is we have to be very careful as disciples of Jesus Christ not to confuse religion with dedication. There's a difference between religion and dedication. We have a tendency nowadays, especially in Western society, because we have so much to, to look at and so much to gather our attention away from God, that we turn our relationship with God into more of a friendship of convenience or more like an acquaintance. Why do I bring that up? Because if we're not dedicated to God, don't ever turn coming to God for every single thing giving your life to God, serving God, doing everything for God over the world. That's not religion. That's dedication to God. Religion is just doing the same thing over and over and over again. That's not what Jesus preached, but Jesus showed dedication through the fact that the first stop that he gave on the path that he was going was to stop and pray. That wasn't a religion thing. It was a dedication thing. We want to be more dedicated to God each and every day because we have a personal relationship with him. Now, we continue on in Luke and we're continuing on now. Here's Jesus. And I want to set this up as a bit of an encouragement for us. If anybody tells you in your life that if you're stressed out, you're anxious, you're going through a hard time, I can't stand when people do this. They, they, they use Jesus more as a, a, a weapon than a help. Oh, then you don't have enough faith. I'm sorry, what? Well, if you're worried, you don't have enough faith. If you're anxious, you don't have enough faith. Uh, really? What did I say that sometimes we have to look at Jesus' life and not just the word he says, but the actions he did? We're going to read in Luke 22, 42 through 46. It says this. Here's Jesus now. He stepped away from his disciples. He's knelt down. He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. What is he praying for? Because he knows what's coming. He knows what's coming. It says, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Why would he need an angel to strengthen him at that point? Because he was in anguish. He was hurting. He knows the plan, yet here he is even telling God at that point, Father, if I don't have to go through this, please don't make me go through this. But I'll do it. Don't ever take away the anguish that Jesus went through. That makes it reality for us. It also is a reminder of what he went through. Because we think sometimes, well, he was fully God and he was fully man, so he knew what pain was coming. He dealt with it. No, no. 
even up to the point that he's getting ready to go. He's, he's begging, literally begging, God, please don't make me do this. Father, please don't make me do this, but your will, not mine, be done. Set it up in, in the understanding that he's in anguish. Why? Because he even tells us, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. So let's see. He's down on his knees saying, please take this away from me, Father. An angel comes to strengthen him. And even at that point, he is still in agony. So what does he do? He prays more earnestly. He prays even stronger. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise up and pray, lest you enter into temptation. I'm not sharing that saying, justifying, don't have faith in God, don't have faith in the Lord, and, and say that, oh, I'm just going to be anxious all the time. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is understand, even our Lord Jesus Christ went through agony and stress and pain. Whether or not he actually was experiencing blood coming from his pores or the sweat drops were so large like blood, that's not the point. The point is he was in such agony that it was causing profuse sweating from him. He was in such agony that an angel had to come down and strengthen him. Jesus was nervous. It's not taking anything away from his deity. It's showing his sacrificial position as a man, as a human being. He understands. That's why when we tell people he understands what we go through, oh, he understands what we go through. I would venture to say we don't understand what he goes through. We love to say that to God all the time. You don't understand what I'm going through. No, 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 no. We have no idea what he went through. I can tell you, I've been nervous in my life. I've had times where I thought I was going to lose my life at work. I thought all this stuff. I've never felt like that, ever. I don't understand what he went through. But I'm going to sit here and pontificate to the Lord that you don't understand me as well. He understands us so much, and yet he is exampling the path that we have to walk. He's telling us. Now, I love the fact that, take note always, when Jesus repeats something, when Jesus has to address something twice. I don't know if you guys picked up, but in the last two sets of verses from Luke, he's told them twice, pray lest you fall into temptation. Pray lest you fall into temptation. Now, was he worried about them being tempted to fall asleep? Obviously not. They couldn't even stay up with him. But mind you, put things in perspective. They've already been up for all day, because now we're probably about 1, 2 in the morning right now at this point. They've already been up. They've been traveling. They showed up. They had to put together a feast. They had to put together a banquet, all this stuff. And now they're probably exhausted at this point. How often do we all get to the point that we just feel exhausted? And I'm about to close my eyes, and I'm driving along, and if it weren't for the blind people with barkers on the side of the road, I would probably drive right off the road. That's them. That's the point they're at. They're following Jesus. They're going after Jesus. Don't ever take away that there's times you're just going to be exhausted in life. But what typically happens when you're exhausted? You start making bad decisions. You start doing the wrong things. So Jesus tells them twice, don't fall into temptation. Why? Because he knows very soon he's no longer going to be with them. They're going to be scared. They're going to be tired. They're going to feel like they're isolated from the whole world. He already knows that Judas is going to betray him. He already knows that Peter's going to deny him. He already knows all this. And yet he is telling them, be prayed up. First thing they do should be prayed up. Well, in another account of this same situation, in Matthew 26, it writes, watch and pray lest you enter in temptation. Why? Because the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing. How often do many of us feel that way, that we were like, we could tell God, I'm, I'm coming after you 100%. God, I got 80% for you. All right, today you're getting 40. I mean, it's just not a good day, God. Why? Because the, the spirit is strong. The spirit inside, when I'm feeling good, I want to chase after you. I can knock down walls. I'm ready to bring on the world. Oh, but then the flesh knocks in and the flesh is weak. Jesus knows. He's not admonishing, he's preparing, he's warning. Why? From the path we need to learn right from the beginning, prayer is a frontline weapon, not a retreat defense. It's a frontline weapon. Why? Jesus knew that he was getting ready to face the toughest challenge of his short life on earth, and he went to God to pray, to prepare, to be ready, to be built up. You know, it's kind of like in, in our military forces, and you know, Josh, you're a Marine. W would you think that it would be better that you guys are getting ready to go into battle? Do you train up ahead of time? Do you get the weapons you need? Do you get the training you need? Do you get the people you need? 
and then going to battle? Or do you guys kind of get together, hey, you guys are going to go to battle today, show up without anything? Which one do you think? Second one, right? Second option is much better. Show up with a picnic basket to a battlefield. It's going to be great. Although David did do that when he beat Goliath. That's another story. So what are we doing? Are we using prayer as a frontline weapon? Are we preparing ourselves? Are we taking the time to get ready? Because I'm telling you right now, people, I will always go back to, you know, from the usual suspects, one of my favorite lines ever from a movie, Kaiser Sose. The greatest trick that the devil ever pulled off was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. If we can convince the world nowadays that you don't need to pray, you don't need to go to God, we're all going to have good days and bad days, don't worry about preparing, then he's already got the drop on us. We are showing up to battle without a single weapon, without a single bit of preparation. Every single day that we put our feet on the floor and step out our front door, as true Christians, we have a target on our back. We're a threat to the enemy. I always sometimes get worried, and, and, and God, please, this is not a challenge, Father. I almost get worried when things are too calm in my life. You know, Yoli and I were talking about last night uh, when we were going to bed, and, you know, when things are too easy in our life, it makes us uncomfortable. It's, you know, my, my brother recently told me, I was hanging out with my family up, up in Port St. Lucie, and my brother told me, he goes, Rich, bro, and my brother's busy as heck. He goes, bro, you guys have to have one of the most hectic lives of anyone I know. Why do you do it? I have no clue. Because I enjoy the abuse? I don't know. Because I, I really don't. I wish I had an answer for you, other than God doesn't allow me not to. But, but think about that. And once again, I know it sounds so awkward and so backwards from everything we know and believe to say. But when things are too calm, it's unsettling. Why? Because well, I'm not a threat. We have to understand our perspective. What, what is our goal? What is our path? Our path is to serve God through Jesus Christ. So if I'm on a path where I'm supposed to be saving lives from an enemy, well, if I'm saving lives from an enemy, what do you think the enemy's going to do? The enemy's going to be mad. The enemy's going to be upset. Am I preparing ahead of time knowing that you're full well going for battle? It's kind of like at work. You know, if, if we're out there training and we go to a good fire and some rookie says, well, I don't want to go in the burning building. What did you think the job entailed? What, you think you just to be on a calendar? Uh, you know, looking good? You know, go to the station and hang out with the crews and ride on the big fire truck? No. We're supposed to put our lives in a situation where other people go, y'all are nuts. Okay, cool. What if we thought that same way about Christianity? Really, seriously. What if I'm willing to say, because I, I, I signed up for the police department, I signed up for the fire department, I love to do that stuff. It's in my nature. And I full well knew what it involved. I knew what I was getting into, which makes it even worse. But yet, here we are. Do we think that way with Christianity? We are going into battle. We're deciding to step into an arena that is dealing with gods and demons and enemies that are so far beyond us. So guess what? If I show up to battle unprepared, that's on me. There's only one person that can prepare me for a battle with this kind of situation, and that's God. That's what Jesus is doing. It's exactly what he's telling us. But what's great is, I talked about it started with betrayal. So yes, physically it started with him in the garden and talking to God. But the first human interaction on his path was Judas, one of his boys, one of the original 12. They would have had the original gang member jackets and everything. So he wasn't even a prospect at that point. He was one of the disciples. And this is one of the guys that's going to betray him. So here Jesus is in the garden praying. He gets up a second time and tells them, hey, guys, you're sleeping again? Get up, start praying, lest you fall into temptation. But guess what? It's too late now because my betrayer comes. He knew he was coming. Man, just food for thought. I'm going to throw this in there. To show you how much Jesus knew what he was getting into and never shied away from a fight. Knowing that Judas was going to betray him after he left the Last Supper, because Judas was at the Last Supper, but Judas was not at the garden with him praying. He already knew what Judas was going to do. Did Jesus run? He No, he went to the garden knowing where he was going to be. Are any of us that dedicated to God and the work of God that I'm willing to go into a place where I know it's going to mess me up, but it's for God and I'm still going to do it anyway? Jesus did that. Just food for thought. He could have run, but he didn't. So Jesus says to Judas, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Why did he say that? Because Judas said, when we go there, they weren't even sure which one Jesus would be. That's how little attention they were really paying to Jesus. Judas said, the one I go up to and kiss, 
he is the one you want. Judas actually had to point him out to the enemy. So he tells him, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? I'm sure Judas went, when those around him saw what was going on to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Mm, we're ready to go to war, God. We're going to protect you, Jesus. So he asked the question, Lord, shall we strike them with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. There you go. Shouldn't have come here in the first place. Can you hear me now? No. Okay. Silence. I'm so sorry. Anyways. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched the ear of the servant and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders who had come to him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. That's how Jesus answered them. What do we want to look at in these verses that I, I think applies to our lives? Well, it's going to lead into the second point is here they come. Here they come. I'm sorry, my brain's going off to the monkeys. Here they come. Walking down the street, I can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't even thinking about that. All of a sudden, that song popped up in my head. <laughs> you knew it, too. You only knew it. Oh, man, he's going to go there. So what does Jesus do? First off, I love the fact that, like I said, he knew where he was going. He knew he was going to be arrested. He knew that Judas was going to hand him up, and yet he still went there. Why would you do that, Jesus? Why wouldn't you go somewhere else? Because it had to happen. It had to happen. This is all part of Jesus telling the Lord, God, if it's your will, please let this cup pass away from me, but your will be done. God obviously told him, you know it's my will. So Jesus went willingly. He didn't put himself in harm's way. No, he's going there. But what I wanted to look at for us, how does the path, how does what's happening in these moments speak to us? Well, just like being frontline prayer warriors and ready for battle, well, notice what it says in verses 49 and 50. It said, when those around him saw what was going on, what did the one disciple ask? Lord, shall we strike him with the sword? And what did Jesus answer him before he struck the guy with the sword? Did you notice what Jesus said there? Neither did I. Jesus didn't answer. How often in our lives do we tell God or pray to God, God, guide me in this. God, give me direction. God, tell me what to do. And before God answers, we make a decision and go in a direction. This disciple standing right next to him, seeing the miracles that Jesus has done. I mean, seriously, guys, you've seen him walk on water. You've seen him bring people back from the dead. You saw him bring Lazarus back out of the grave. You've seen him heal blind. I, you've seen him do all this. Why didn't you just wait for an answer for two seconds? Should I strike him with a sword? I got this. And he swacks him off the ear. And Jesus is like, really, bro? Seriously? I'm sitting here trying to preach love and surrender to the Lord, and you're causing trouble for me. Oy, and then he heals him. But I, I, that resonated with me of, of like, man, how many times do I go to the Lord? Oh, i got to make a decision here. God, you want me to do this, right? Well, let's go. And then when I go and I get in trouble, what the heck happened, Jesus? I, I wasn't with you. I didn't tell you to go do that. I was, that wasn't my thought. You asked me. You didn't bother to wait for an answer. No, I'm impatient, God. I asked you yesterday, and you haven't answered my prayer yet today. It's been a full 24 hours. Oh, my God. We have to wait on the Lord. I, I know it's so hard. Trust me. I'm a very impatient. I'm very impulsive. It's difficult, but this is preaching to me as well. If I'm going to ask God, if I don't ask him at all, then don't worry about it. But if I'm going to ask him, guide me and give me direction, then I got to wait for him to answer. I got to give him that moment. So Jesus, you know, as usual with the disciples, I got you. I'll, 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 I'll fix what you broke. Why? Because permit even this, he tells them. But what I wanted to also look at when it comes to us and the concept of here they come, how often in our life do we feel like the world is just coming after us as if we did something massively wrong? How often do we feel like the world is collapsing around us and coming after us like Jesus? You come at me like I'm a robber. You're coming at me with sticks and clubs and bats and you're just trying to beat me down. What, what did I do? I didn't do anything to you. No, we don't like the things you say. We don't like the things you believe. You're so nice, you let us walk all over you, so we're going to be meaner to you than everybody else. Do you feel like the whipping goat at the, at the work? Because everybody's like, coming after you, coming after you. You see, Jesus knew what was coming, and he still dealt with it because he was prepared. What happens when the rest of us in our life where we don't even know something's coming, and then bam, we get hit with something? It knocks us completely off track. It knocks us off our path. It knocks us off our way because we don't know it's coming. But Jesus was already prepared for them. You see, the enemy thought they had it orchestrated. Oh, we're going to show up. We're going we're to get one of his own boys to betray him. 
We're going to pay him for it. We're going to get him to point him out to us. We're going to show up and we're going to take him by force. Jesus was ready. He was ready. You know, he sat there and just was ready for it. He willingly allowed them to take it. But what is awesome that speaks to me loudly out of this was the situation doesn't dictate the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord will dictate the situation. Why? Jesus willingly went into the situation knowing it was going to happen. Despite the fact that from the outside world and for me and my BC time, I would hear this story and I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me, Jesus. You could have just walked away. You could have wiped them out. You could have done whatever. Why did he not do that? Because he was in complete control the whole time. True power is strength under control. That is Jesus. Could have wiped them out, could have done whatever. But that would have gone against what the Father wanted to be done and what had to be done. Jesus was in full control the whole time. Don't ever think in our lives when something's going wrong, something's not happening right, that that means we're completely out of control, that God's not in it. People would have thought the same thing about Jesus, I'm sure. How can you say you're in control, Jesus? You let them arrest you because I was controlling myself to let it happen so that God could be glorified and raised in this family through it. But that's hard to take. That's hard to deal with. That's not easy. But look at that and tell and remind ourselves, man, Jesus was in control the whole time. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. He willingly did it. He was not taken by surprise or by force. He allowed it to happen. That should speak to our situation so many times. That when I'm going through something, it doesn't matter. God is in control. Because he's got me on his path. Well, we're going to jump ahead a little bit because the next part in the path, uh, you know, especially as it relates to the stations of the cross, would have been the denial of Peter. Now, the only reason I'm not going to dive deeply into it is we did Peter and his forgiveness as one of our sermons from the last teaching series. So you can jump into that on YouTube or catch up or read the verses on your own where Peter denied him. But right after that, what's the last station or the last part of the path that we're going to cover today? Well, that's Jesus going in front of the Sanhedrin. Now, we've learned before the Sanhedrin was the religious council's leaders of both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, Think of them as different denominations of the same faith. They believed different things, but they were all the religious leaders at, at the time. And the religious leaders ran the city and the people at that time. That was the way that Judaism worked in the cities, that they ran it. So Jesus has to come in front of them. Now, mind you, Jesus was already being mocked and beaten. I mean, from the day he was, from the moment he was arrested, they started with the mocking and the beating. It wasn't just the scourging. Right before he's supposed to go into the Sanhedrin and stand in front of the council, they're already talking about the fact that the Roman guards were putting blindfolds over his head, punching him, hitting him, and saying, oh, come on, you're the Lord. Prophesy who's hitting you. Can't you see who's hitting you? Now, I, I, my brain immediately goes to, well, we're talking about that show 24. Man, if I'm sitting there watching a show like that, I don't know about you guys, you're watching a show where the bad guy just keeps getting away with everything, keeps getting away. Your blood starts to boil a little bit. You're like, oh, man, I wish I was there. I'd love to punch somebody and hit somebody. Yet Jesus didn't do any of that. He just stayed quiet. That's why when anybody, anybody says, oh, why would you follow Jesus? He was weak. He didn't didn't do anything to these people. He let them do it. I said, man, that's strength none of us will ever understand. To sit there and take that and not fight back and willingly go to be the sacrificial lamb for the slaughter. That's strength that none of us would ever understand. Now, Jesus goes in front of these leaders, and Jesus is in front of them, and they keep asking him questions, asking him questions, asking him questions. Well, who, do you, who are you? Who do you say you are? Who do you believe you are? Yada, yada, yada. I love that Jesus retorts back and says, why would I bother telling you? You're not going to believe me anyways. Why am I going to waste my breath telling you who I think I am or who I know I am? You're not going to believe it anyways. And even if I do tell you, it's not like you're going to let me go. So make up your own assumptions. How, how many times do we feel like, We have to defend God and ourselves in such a way that we're going to justify God. Jesus didn't need to justify himself to them because they were the enemy. Jesus didn't need to justify his actions to them because he didn't follow them or have anything in common with them. He was on a different path. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't preach the gospel. It doesn't mean we don't share love to the lost. It doesn't mean we don't share Jesus Christ with everybody. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I don't have to justify what I believe to everybody, anyone. Take that as an encouragement. You don't have to justify what you believe. If you know Jesus Christ, your life has been changed by him. You're a new man or woman. You're a new son or daughter in Jesus Christ. I don't have to justify it to nobody. That's me. 
Jesus was only needed to be justified to one person. That was God the Father. Everybody else was just noise. They didn't even bother. So finally they say to him in Luke 22, 70 through 71, they've gone back and forth with him. Then they finally said, they all said, are you then the son of God? I love Jesus. He's a gangster sometimes. You rightly say that I am. That's all that he says. You rightly say that I am. I'm going to find a way to use that at work one of these days. And they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. That, that was enough to condemn Jesus in their eyes to be sent to the cross. What I love is that Jesus drops who he is without hesitation. He didn't back up. He didn't think of some eloquent way to say it. There's another encouragement to us when we share the gospel, we share the life-changing presence of Jesus in our life. You don't always have to be eloquent. You have to be firm. There's a difference. I can baffle you with all I know, and that's great. Or sometimes I can just answer with confidence. And you're like, oh, snap, I guess he doesn't even have to justify himself for me. No, I don't. Jesus didn't. All Jesus said, you rightly say that I am. Bam, done. To me, that's like a mic drop moment. Like, what, do you, what do you say back to that? What do you come back with him on that? Because he doesn't care what they think. He doesn't care what they believe about him. He knows who he is and what he's there for. So there you go. And he just tells them. And I love that. Well, what I want to look at as we close, and, and I'll bring it all together for this first part of the path. And this is what I want to do every single week. We are all on a path for God, every single one of us. The minute you decided to give your life and step into the arena, you're in it, people. We're here. We got work to do. That's why we're very big on this church. We just don't want to bring you into a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. We want you to grow constantly as disciples of Jesus Christ. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Jesus Christ, God doesn't need more people watching from the sidelines and cheering him on. He knows he's in charge. What he needs more is disciples, people that are going to follow him, people that are going to do the work for him. That is why we exist as a church. That's why we exist. And we're not going to stop that. And that's what I want us to understand is we're going through the path. Every single one of us has a path that we're on with God. We all have a starting point. We all have a de destination we've got to get to. What's your path going to look like in between A and Z? That's all I'm going to challenge everybody with as we go through this series. Every single one of the moments of the stations of the cross has a purpose in our life. We've already gone through these, and every single one of them has a purpose already in our life, and that's the goal, is to bring this path of Jesus, this 24-hour period from life to death to life again, and resonate it and put it into our lives for applicability. How can we live our lives? Well, what I'll finish with is, Anytime we're going to be on a path for God, well, what's the first thing we got to do? Well, we got to have Jesus Christ in our life. So let's close our eyes, let's pray, and let's open up the door to God in our life for anybody in person or online that does not have a relationship with the Lord through Jesus Christ, that does not have that relationship with God. I, I can't be on a path with somebody if I'm not with the person in the first place. So Lord, I pray today, Lord, and I, and I encourage everybody here, whether or not they've been church members their whole life, whether or not they've been in this church since we opened, whether or not they've been reading the scriptures, it doesn't matter. If they've never come into a true relationship with you, if they've never surrendered their life to you, if they've never put themselves on the path with you, well, well, well then God, I pray today is that day. I pray today they take off the shackles, they take off the so-so the attitude towards you, the it's nice to know you're there God attitude, and enter into a fully surrendered and renewed relationship through Jesus Christ. So whether you're here in person or you're online, I'm going to encourage you. And whether or not it's about giving your life to God or whether you're deciding I need to, to come back to Him, I need to get my life right with Him, I need to get on the path because I am so far off the path, I feel like I can't even see God right now. I'm so far away from Him right now, I don't know where I'm walking or where my journey's taking me, but I know it's not where He wants me to go. And today I want to encourage you as well that the gospel is just what we're learning about through this path series. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came down from his place in heaven as God the Son, lived a life not without temptation. It was tempted, but without sin. He never broke the laws of sin against the Father, lived a life without it, and yet died a sinner's death so that we could have redemption through him. Just like the series, The Path, it may sound narrow-minded, because it is, there's only one path to God. And that same path 
that Jesus Christ walked was to create the single path for us to go through to come to a relationship with God the Father. That's it. Can't make it up. Can't decide how we want it to look like. We can't go away from doctrine because it sounds right to us. It is told to us how it is and how it's supposed to be. The God of the Bible defines who he is and what he does, not us. So I pray today that each one of us gets on that path with God, and that only starts by getting through the right person. So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, if you've never said, I, I have a relationship with Jesus, if you even have, have started following Jesus at some point, but you're not following him now, I want to encourage you, make that decision today. Don't let another day go by. For anybody here, I'm going to encourage you. Everybody's got their head bowed, their eyes closed. This is a moment of privacy. If that is you, if today that you have never been in a relationship with Jesus, you've never surrendered your life with God, you've never truly gotten on the path, or you've gotten so far off the path, you need to come back to him, I'm going to encourage you, raise your hand right now. Just raise your hand. Come back to Jesus. Get back on the path. Start your life with him. Start the walk with him. He knows you're there. He's extending his hand. All you got to do is take it. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray for everybody today, whether in person or online, Lord, that made that decision in their heart, Lord, that they know that they need you. They know they get the back on the path with you. God, speak into each one of us. Speak into them. Strengthen us, Lord. Keep us in your walk. Keep us in your way. Lord, prepare us for the battle. Prepare us for the way. So that anytime we face a path like you face, Lord, we have you in our corner strengthening us the whole way. Just like you had the Father with you throughout that path. God, please be with us. For each one of us, Lord, strengthen us this week. As we're coming into Easter season, Lord, I pray you light a new fire inside each one of us. Lord, that you not only remind us of we didn't deserve your love and your sacrifice, yet we all have accepted and received it, and we're on that new path. But God, I pray that lights a fire in all of us to go out and find other lost people and bring them on the path of salvation through you. God, this is the perfect season to do it. Lord, give each one of us opportunity. Give each one of us discernment. Give each one of us words to share. Lord, to ultimately bring more people into a relationship with you because that's all that it's about. So Lord, we pray that you go before us. Lord, we pray that you strengthen us. Lord, we pray that you keep us on the path throughout our life until we reach that final destination. So Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. And it's in your precious name we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen. Good Sunday, everybody. So the Bible that I would be holding that looks just like that one over there, if you made that decision today or you need a Bible in hand, please see one of the team members. If you're watching online, please message us. We'd love to put a Bible in your hands. For the rest of us, let's have an amazing week. And let's start inviting people, getting prepared for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So amen, everybody. Good Sunday.